Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video. Today's video was originally intended to be about Green Boots who was an unidentified John Doe on Everest who was later identified. But as I wrote the script for this video it slowly morphed into what it is you're about to see. Consider it a cautionary tale of sorts. I talk a lot about the dangers of Everest, I talk about other bodies found on Everest and it is something a little bit different for my channel but I hope you find it interesting nonetheless. Mount Everest is notorious. It's the tallest mountain in the world located in the Himalayas at the border between Nepal and Tibet. The official elevation of Everest is 8,848 metres or 29,029 feet. That's a big mountain. Each year more than 600 people reach the summit of Everest and about double that number will at least attempt to. Many of these people will never reach a summit. They either have to turn back due to difficulties or illness or they perish in the attempt. And many of the people who die on the mountain remain unidentified for many, many years. Some are still unidentified. In this video, we're gonna talk about the dangers of Everest, the challenge and the deaths that can happen up there. I'm going to tell you the story of a man known for years only as Green Boots. I know this video is a little bit different, but it's January and I'm just trying to experiment with some different kinds of content for the new year, so let me know what you think. Before I started researching for this video, I had little idea about Everest. I knew that it would obviously be dangerous to climb such a tall mountain, I figured it would probably be a little bit chilly. But consider myself educated because I had no idea how treacherous the journey really is. So, you want to climb Everest, how do you do it? First up, you need to be fit and healthy, both mentally and physically. You need to be 18 years old, obviously, and preferably you need to have years and years of experience in mountain climbing. This is not a starter mountain, this is the peak, excuse the pun, of mountaineering. You need to be able to understand the logistics and be able to act on something without even thinking about it. You need to be able to anticipate change in the environment. You need to know on a split second if you're gonna need to add or remove clothing or equipment. Everything about mountaineering needs to be second nature to you on Everest, otherwise you'll probably end up dead. And you also need money, of course. Foreigners must buy an $11,000 permit from the Nepalese government in order to even attempt the climb past base camp. Each climber also needs to pay $600 each to the Pollution Control Committee, who regularly fix the route to the summit. Almost every foreigner who climbs Everest will use the services of a commercial expedition operator who can charge around $60,000 per expedition. This generally offers one local guide per climber, a Sherpa, plus one Western guide for every four climbers. There are local expedition services who charge less, around $35,000 per climb, and there are even some more that charge even less than that which does begin to raise questions over the level of safety and experience of the people running these particular expeditions. If you want something good, you're looking at around $60,000 per climb. And then of course there's all the cost of the equipment, the oxygen, the food and the camping which adds up pretty quickly. The local guides who assist in the journeys up the mountain are called Sherpas, referring to an ethnic group native to the most mountainous areas of Nepal and the Himalayas. Generations of living in the high altitudes of the Himalayas have led to a natural genetic allowance for the thin air up there. Most foreigners who attempt to climb Everest will have a Sherpa by their side every step of the way. These are local people, they know the area and the culture, and they have much more energy and ability and power to climb the mountains than most. The Sherpas help carry the equipment, they know the routes, they know the ropes, literally. They're a vital part of any expedition. Although a lot of Sherpas nowadays are not actually part of the ethnic group Sherpas, but local men from the nearby towns, but they're still referred to by the name. A Sherpa can earn up to $6,000 or £4,500 for each expedition, which is 10 times the standard wage in Nepal. It's a very well sought after job in the region, but the Sherpas aren't immune to the dangers of Everest. They can deal with it better, but almost half of who have died on Everest have been Sherpa guides. Most people who attempt to climb Everest do so from the Nepal side, taking a short flight from the capital Kathmandu to Lukla, where they will do the original 10 day trek to Everest base camp, which is at 17 and a half thousand feet. Some more experienced climbers will forgo the trek to base camp altogether, catching a helicopter up there. But this is a pretty important part of the trek, this trek to base camp, as it allows you to slowly acclimate to the altitude. 
Once at base camp, people will usually spend a while there to get used to the altitude properly, making short treks up and down the mountain before attempting the route up to the summit, which opens annually in May. Before May, the trek is way too treacherous to even attempt. The climbing season is short, usually just a few weeks in May, maybe the beginning of June. Monsoon season takes place in the summer and the winter is, well, winter. But even in the climbing season, Everest is still dangerous. You've got the obvious things to worry about, like the weather, getting caught in storms or avalanches or being hit by falling boulders. There's also the risk of falling, leading to death or injury. But even just an injury on Everest can be a death sentence because there's limited options if you do hurt yourself. And mountain rescue can take a while to help those in need, which is very difficult when it's freezing cold. The first climbers made it to the top of Everest in May 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. It was part of a British expedition and only about 5,000 people have reached the summit since then. Most climbers who die simply end up succumbing to the elements, the freezing temperatures and the high altitude. Sometimes it's due to running out of their supplemental oxygen. The air can get a little thin above the 26,000 feet point, an area which is aptly referred to as the death zone. The side effects of a shortage of oxygen can cause headaches, nausea and exhaustion and all of this is just amplified on Everest. One climber called David Breeshears described the lack of oxygen as feeling like running on a treadmill and breathing through a straw. Human bodies aren't designed to be at such a high altitude and aside from the general lack of oxygen, the side effects of being so high up can be a lack of muscle control, which is not ideal when your life depends on walking. You can have impaired speech, confusion and hallucinations. There's also the chance of frostbite and hypothermia due to the sub-freezing temperatures and you can also get pulmonary edemas due to the altitude. In the 2019 season alone, 11 people died. 10 of these were on their way back down from the summit because reaching the summit is really only half the work. To reach the summit of Everest, climbers must walk through a number of corpses, the bodies of climbers who did succumb to the dangers of the trek. The majority of people who have died up there remain in the exact place they died. Trekkers literally have to step over their limbs to reach the summit, a lot of the time barely able to even see them over their oxygen masks. The dead climbers are often frozen solid in dangerous to reach places, too difficult to remove from the mountain. Bodies are found scattered all around, some perched on rocks just sat as if they're still living, but frozen solid. Some are found lying in caves where they've retreated to escape the outside conditions. Some are found lying face down, some are frozen in a walking position, and it's really hard to tell how long a body has been there. The freezing conditions mean that they're usually very well preserved. Without an expert eye, a lot of the time you'd have no idea if a body has been there a week, a year or a decade. Some are even naked with other climbers having stripped them of their clothing. It's all for yourself on Everest. The bodies now act as landmarks along the route to the summit. One of these landmarks being known as green boots. A body every climber ascending from the north side must pass on their way to the peak. Once a climber reaches green boots, they know they're not too far off from their goal. And thus begins our story of green boots. Who is he? How did he get to where he is? How did he die? And why is he still there? The body known as green boots lies at an altitude of about 27,890 feet, lying in an almost fetal position in between what is known as the first and second step. He's decked out in all the gear, a red coat, blue trousers, oxygen canisters lying by his back and of course a pair of green boots, crampons still attached to the bottom. Now I never usually include photos of dead bodies in these videos but here is your warning, I'm about to include a photo of green boots. There is nothing graphic about this body, you can't even see any skin, just the clothing. But it shows how perfectly preserved he is in the freezing conditions. He lies on his left side at the entrance to a cave, a cave in which about 80% of climbers take a rest at on their route to the summit. Just chilling in this cave with a dead body, only on Everest. The first talks of green boots came around in 2001, when on the 21st of May, a French climber named Pierre Paperon filmed him lying there. According to Pierre, the Sherpas he was with told him that this was the body of a Chinese mountaineer and that he'd only been there about six months. 
And that was kind of it. Green Boots just remained where he is. But why do the dead bodies remain on Everest? Why are they not moved? Some are simply in too hard to reach places, having fallen into crevices, never to be seen again. They can't be removed for obvious reasons. For the bodies which are easy to reach, just dead on the trail, they're frozen and extremely, extremely heavy. It's physically demanding to remove these bodies that have to be carried frozen back down the mountain. The trek on Everest is challenging and dangerous enough for people just carrying the regular supplies and regular equipment. It becomes even more difficult when you've then got to carry a body down the mountain which is why that simply doesn't happen. When the bodies are to be retrieved, Sherpas are the ones left in charge of this retrieval. First, they have to reach the body before putting the frozen bodies in some type of rigging, usually a piece of fabric, sometimes a sled. They tie ropes to it and simply slide it back down the mountain to the next base camp. Although some helicopters are technically able to fly above Camp 2 of Everest, they don't tend to do so as it's pretty dangerous. Camp 2 is the limit, meaning that bodies usually have to be transported all the way down to Camp 2 before a helicopter is able to retrieve it. And it's incredibly, incredibly dangerous to do this. When Sherpas go to retrieve these bodies, they're doing so knowing they're putting themselves in danger. For most people, it's known that with climbing Everest comes the risk of not coming back down. And therefore, many climbers will make their wishes known before they begin the ascent. Most say they'd prefer to have their body left on the mountain, hopefully somewhere out of sight, rather than risk the lives of others and have their body recovered. People who climb Everest know that this is the risk that comes with the territory. But it's not always as straightforward as that. Some families want their loved ones back for a closure, a proper burial. And the Sherpa communities, the Himalayan natives, actually consider leaving the dead on Everest as disrespectful to the gods of the region, the gods of the mountain. Periodically, Nepalese climbing companies will attempt to remove the bodies from the mountain, but they'll often reach roadblocks to the families who want their loved ones to remain on the mountain as per their last wishes. Basically, it's all very confusing with political, religious and safety implications. Therefore, most of the time, the bodies just end up staying in the exact spot where they died. It's estimated that as of the early 21st century, there are about 200 corpses on the mountain, although I've seen numbers varying from 200 to 290. So for a long time, nobody really had any clue who this man was with the green boots. As far as my research shows, it didn't really look like anybody put in any huge effort to identify him. Bodies are just par for the course on Everest. But eventually the name Siwang Paljo begins to circulate. He was a 28 year old Indian climber, a police officer it seems, who disappeared, died during an expedition in 1996 which means that when Green Boots was first recorded in 2001, he'd likely already been lying there for over five years. Si Wang was part of an expedition as part of a six-member team, from what I can gather, all Indian men. On the day him and his party attempted to summit, it's reported that Si Wang was wearing green boots. But on the 10th of May 1996, the group of these six men overslept. They left Camp 6 four and a half hours later than they'd originally planned to, and this was the day they'd intended to summit. But seeing as they'd left so late, they decide just to attempt a small trek and come back down, rather than attempt the summit as was intended that day. They knew that it would be too late and too dark to attempt the death zone by the time they reached it. It was instructed for all members of the group to turn back by 3pm at the latest, but when the team leader gave orders to turn around, he was either ignored or he couldn't be seen or heard in the bad weather conditions. The leader and two others decide to turn back, however the other three men decided to go for the summit. These were Siwang Samanla, Dorje Morup and Siwang Paljo. And they eventually walkie talkie the team leader to let him know their intentions, they're going to summit that day. At about 5.45pm the climbers radio to the expedition leader that they had indeed reached the summit, although the weather was terrible. They spend a short while at the top before Samantha tells the others to begin the descent back down the mountain. He says he's going to remain at the top and hold a religious ceremony. But as I mentioned earlier in this video, most people who die on Everest do so on the descent and they were in a pretty bad blizzard and it was dark. The rest of the group never hear from them again, although some members of the group at the camp below did think they saw two headlights moving in the distance. 
When they never returned, it was accepted that they had simply died on the mountain. It's thought that eight people died on the mountain just that day due to the bad weather conditions. But whilst it is commonly believed that Green Boots is the body of Si Wang Paljo, it's also possible that it could be the body of Dorje Moro. There were a Japanese group who had reported seeing Moro moving slowly down the mountain, that he was no longer wearing gloves, his hands were frostbitten, and he was having trouble unclipping his carabiner. The Japanese group had to assist him in moving down to the next bit of rope, as he was having so much trouble in doing so. That same group later discovered the body of Si Wang Samanla close to the summit, and on their return they report that Dorje Morup and Si Wang Paljo were still making very slow progress down the mountain alone, although they did not report that they seemed to be in any kind of trouble. The Japanese later received a lot of criticism, saying that they didn't take time out to help these men. But as a later press conference pointed out, by stopping to help others on Everest, you're putting your own life on the line. The location of Morup at the last point they saw him leads people to believe that he could indeed be green boots instead of Si Wang. But Si Wang was the one last wearing green boots, so it is more than likely him. In May 2014, something strange happened though. Green boots was reported as missing. Adventurer Noel Hanna discovered that he was no longer there. Green boots was no longer where he was for the last 18 years, and nobody's entirely sure what happened to him, although there is speculation. And it wasn't only Si Wang's body that had disappeared. Many of the bodies on the north side of the summit, an area often referred to as Rainbow Ridge because of all the colorful suits, seemed to have vanished. The general consensus that was nothing hugely mysterious, simply that the Chinese went in and moved the bodies, although we don't have confirmation of that. China tends to keep pretty quiet on these kinds of things. And when I say there's a possibility that the Chinese moved the bodies, I don't mean that they recovered them and took them down the mountain. It seems the bodies may have just literally been moved to areas where they're less visible to other climbers. An article I found on The Guardian from 2010 spoke of a team of Nepali mountaineers headed to the death zone to clear the tons of rubbish that have been left there over the years and to remove some of the dead bodies of climbers. Although before then many expeditions had set out to clear parts of the mountain, the death zone had never been attempted before as it was so dangerous. So before 2010, literally every person who had ever died in the death zone remained in the position that they had died. But for this particular trip in 2010, they actually got the family's consent to remove certain bodies and bring them down the mountain to cremate. It really could just be as simple as this. Maybe Green Boots was one of the bodies that was cleared in the following years by Nepal or by China. Although as of 2017, it seems like some climbers have reported that he's been spotted again in the same place he was all along. They've reported reaching the landmark of Green Boots. So maybe he remains in the cave simply covered by some stones or maybe a different body lays there now instead. Because so few people reach the point of Green Boots annually, reports are few and far between and they're often unreliable. These people aren't journalists, they're mountaineers, they're not really paying close attention to what is happening to Green Boots. So they just sort of report, yeah, we fit Green Boots and that's it. They don't really pay much more attention to it than that. The body of Si Wan Paljo is also closely related to the body of the story of a different climber, English mountaineer David Sharp. David had attempted to summit Everest twice before and he'd never succeeded. So in 2006, he was determined to reach the peak. This was a solo climb he was undertaking to be attempted without using supplemental oxygen, which is extremely risky even for the most experienced of climbers, even for Sherpas. But David thought that it wasn't a true climb if he used extra oxygen. David was climbing solo with a group of 13 other independent climbers. Although it wasn't an organized expedition and they had no requirement to remain together and look out for each other, they were just 13 people doing it independently, but kind of in a group. And David had the most basic of packages, the bare bones that most experienced climbers would need to reach the summit. It's thought that he set out from his last camp high in the mountain on the 14th of May 2006. He took very little oxygen with him that he only intended to use in a complete emergency situation. It's not entirely clear if he ever reached the summit or not, if he perished on the ascent or descent, but due to the darkness, he was forced to camp out exposed, unable to reach the closest camp. 
He reaches Green Boots Cave and rests there, waiting for the night to end. Only this was one of the coldest nights of the season and he had no supplies on him. It was kind of inevitable that David wouldn't survive the night and he had no radio to contact anyone to let them know that he needed help. There was a lot of controversy around David's death. Because he was climbing independently and radioless, and he didn't tell anyone that he was attempting to reach the summit that day, people in his independent climbing group didn't figure out that he may even be in trouble until the evening of 15th of May. But multiple other climbers, about 40 people to be exact, passed David in Green Boots Cave on May 15th, and it seemed at first that little attempt was made to help him. David was first seen at 5am on the 15th by an expedition to put the first Turkish woman on the summit. This woman was Burchak Pochan and she'd been having some trouble herself, having suddenly lost consciousness as she made it halfway up the second step. She's carried down the ridge by the Sherpas and is nursed back to consciousness, but as they're doing so, something catches the eye of the lead Sherpa. The lead Sherpa was a man called Dawa, and he expected to see the body of Green Boots where they were, but he was shocked when he saw a second body tucked up by Green Boots' feet. And he soon realises that it's not a body. The man, who we now know to be David Smith, was still alive, but barely. He's unable to speak, his face black from frostbite, his legs frozen solid, and he had all the indications that hypothermia had taken over. It was obvious that David had been there all night, and Dawa had a decision to make. He was a Sherpa assigned to looking after Burchak, who was incredibly, incredibly ill. He himself was injured and there was only one other Sherpa with them who was exhausted. It wouldn't have been possible for this group to carry David or to assist him in any way. David was just too far gone. Soon after this, Burchak's husband and another Sherpa arrived at the cave and they stopped to give some hot water to David who by this point is completely unresponsive. So they also decide to leave him. At 9.30am, another group of climbers pass on their way back down from the summit. They also see David and they attempt to give him oxygen and they dragged him out of the shade into sunlight. But David couldn't stand up and no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't get him moving. And they couldn't carry him. So they continue on their journey alone. And it must have been soon after that that David succumbed to the elements and died. At first, this death was just reported as one of many of the season. But it was on May 22nd when the controversy and uproar around his death begins. Mark Inglis was a 46-year-old New Zealand double amputee who had reached the summit around the same time that David was dying. He was the first ever double amputee to do so. And he gave some interviews in Kathmandu after his expedition, in which he stated that 40 people went past Sharp and only one group of Sherpas offered help. Everyone else apparently ignored him. This goes worldwide and people are outraged that this man was left to die on the side of the mountain and nobody helped him. But even Mark later revised his statement saying that his recollection was unclear, he was in a bad place, he'd just finished climbing Everest and maybe he was wrong. But by this point it was too late and the whole ethics of climbing Everest were called into question. And these were actually led by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first person to ever summer Everest. Hillary tells New Zealand newspapers, I think the whole attitude towards climbing Mount Everest has become rather horrifying. People just want to get to the top. They don't give a damn for anybody else who may be in distress. But I do have to question how much could have been done for David. Most people who came across him were on the descent, their energy and the oxygen already spent and they're barely able to get down the mountain themselves, let alone help anyone else. If David was able to walk or even stand upright, then maybe they would have felt more of an obligation to get him down the mountain. But David was moments away from death when he was discovered. It would have been putting rescuers' own lives in danger to get him down, when it would be unlikely that he would have survived the journey himself in the first place. I think the biggest ethical question that came out of David's death wasn't that of the climbers. It was the ethics of the trekking company, Asian Trekking, that had allowed him to climb alone for just $7,000 with no oxygen at the most basic of supplies and no Sherpa or guide. Should that even be something that is allowed? It almost seems like people are paying $7,000 to this company for the pleasure of their own deaths. The most advanced mountaineers will always stress the importance of Sherpas and oxygen. And the human race is always going to want to better itself. If there's a challenge, there will always be somebody out there to conquer it. 
So of course, if a company is offering the ability to do this, to climb Everest for just $7,000 with no oxygen and no guide, there's going to be some people that take it. And people don't usually have $60,000 for the advanced services, but a lot of people do have $7,000. And some things are expensive for a reason. It seems like David's body remains on the mountain to this day, but he was simply moved out of sight in 2007. Now, I did intend to tell you some more stories of other bodies found on the mountain, but each tale is scarily similar. Most perish on the descent, exhausted with a complete lack of oxygen. Many fall into crevices. Most bodies remain in the place they died, but some get the dignity of being pushed out of view of other climbers. Their bodies don't become yet another landmark like green boots. Sometimes Sherpas will head up and remove the bodies they can safely. But there's no denying that attempting to summit Everest is one of the most dangerous things a human can do. For as long as humans live, there will always be people trying to push themselves, push the boundaries. But the bodies along the route serve as a cautionary tale. Don't push yourself, don't be stupid, and don't make rash decisions. You can die up there and you will remain up there for all eternity. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've got any requests for similar videos or any video at all, then make sure you put them in the comments down below. Make sure you click that subscribe button down below and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.